Hello and welcome to the Illinois State Museum's Tales from the Vault presentation. Today we are taking you behind the scenes of our upcoming exhibit, Fashioning Illinois, 1820 to 1900. My name is Erica Holst, I'm the Curator of History, and right now we are literally going to take you into the vault where we store our costumes and textiles. So we're right here outside of B3, um, textile storage. We're gonna go inside and I'm going to show you some of the items in our textile collection. So the Illinois State Museum curates an estimated 12 million objects. About 20,000 of those are in the history collection, and these are stored both here downtown in our uh, museum facility, and they're also stored off-site at our research and collection center. So the vault we're in right now is a textile storage facility that is temperature and humidity controlled. Um, lights are off unless a human being is in here. Um, it is secured. And this is the place where uh, clothing comes that is an older part of our collection. So the garments in here tend to have individual histories and provenances. It represents only a fraction of our entire textile collections. Downtown or down across town at the Research and Collection Center, we have a larger garment and textile collection. And this um, largely came to us by absorbing collections from Illinois State University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And so those tend to be larger collections that we have less information individually on, but encompass a broader range of garments. So I'm gonna open some doors for you and just kind of show you the type of things that we have in here. We have both um, upright storage um, for hanging garments and we have uh, acid-free boxes containing garments. So first we'll go into the hanging storage. And these are the cabinets that will make any historic clothing enthusiast's heart beat just a little bit faster. I know mine did when I first started this job. Um, our earliest clothing starts um, about actually the 1850s, um, which is going to be on display in the exhibition. So the garments we have hanging in this cabinet date um, mainly from the 1860s, uh, 70s, and 80s. So for example, we've got this nice wool uh, day dress that dates from around 1870. Um, it's even got its attached cape and its lace collar here. And as I said, these are the objects um, that have provenance to them. So we know that this one was worn, we don't actually know her name, but we know this one came from Waverly, Illinois. This is a beautiful butter colored silk dress from about the mid 1860s. Um, this belonged to a woman named Elizabeth Reed. And here we have a dress from the later 1870s. Um, she's got her bustle, it's a more elaborate dress in terms of its um, mixing of fabrics and the trim. And this reflects a time when the uh, sewing machine has made its appearance into women's fashion. The sewing machine was supposed to be a time saver and in some instances it was. You could definitely do your sewing faster with the sewing machine. The downside was that once the sewing machine became available, women's fashions grew more elaborate. So now all the time you saved in making a simple shirt was eaten up by trying to get all these pleats and ruffles and gathers and details onto your garments. So these cabinets continue more or less chronologically. Um, we're moving um, more into the later 19th century in this cabinet. This is one of my favorite dresses. It was worn by uh, Mary Elizabeth Kiesling of 
let's see, Mason County, Illinois. And you can see we've actually got the wedding photo here. So here's the garment, and there's Mary Elizabeth right there wearing her dress. As historians, we love it when that happens. And so for dresses to hang in these cabinets, um, first of all, they're on padded hangers that uh, support the weight here. Um, they're also clipped on the waist and they're, some of them are clipped on the waist and padded with um, fabric to reduce the stress on the waist. And the garments that hang tend to be the ones that are in the strongest condition structurally. So these um, can, can stand up to being with other garments and hanging like this. Some of our more fragile things we keep in acid-free boxes laying horizontally. So I'll show you some of those as well. Oh, but before I do that, let's just pull out a couple more dresses because they're so pretty and every time I open this closet, I just want to see more and more. Here's a very elaborate blue velvet dress. This one is Source Unknown, and that happens. Um, our collections have been growing since um, 1877 is when the museum founded. So some things come to us with very detailed histories. Some things are things that we've had in the collection for perhaps 100 years, and the provenance or history attached to it has been lost along the way. Now this is an example. Um, this is what you would call a Titanic era dress, somewhere from around the uh, 1910s. And this uh, was made in Chicago. And it looks like we don't have an owner for this either, but beautiful. And if you want to follow me around, I'll show you another favorite. This is where we store our children's clothing. So you'll notice a lot of these kids' clothes are white, which is probably the least practical color to dress a child in in the 21st century. Um, I know my son would have immediately spilled juice down the front of any white outfit, and then you as a mother are left with a stained garment. In the 19th century, white children's clothing was actually the most logical choice because the white clothes were the ones that you could throw in a boiling pot and scrub the heck out of. Any children's clothing that was dyed um, just couldn't stand up to that kind of treatment. So you do see we do have some colorful children's clothing here and this would have been the nice clothing that the uh, child was um, probably admonished to sit very still while wearing. We have a little dress here and this might have actually belonged to a boy or a girl. A gender gender Differences didn't appear in children's clothing until about the age of three to seven. Nineteenth century people thought that it was more important to distinguish adults from children than boys from girls. So until they were about, you know, three to seven years old, boys and girls had a very sort of unisex look. They were all in skirts and dresses because this made it easier to deal with a non-toilet trained child. When a little boy went into pants, it was called breaching, and this was considered a milestone in his life. And then, unfortunately for boys, in the late 19th century, there became a fashion for dressing little boys in absolutely ridiculous and overdone costumes. This is kind of a takeoff of an 18th century ensemble here. There was also a popular look called the Little Lord Fauntleroy suit that involved a big white collar and um, fluffy cuffs, and you can just tell that any boy who was in this was itching to get out of it within half a second but the mothers probably thought they were precious. In addition to our garments, we do have a large collection of accessories as well. You can see some of our hats are stored here. Some of these are little kitty hats and muffs. And in our um, horizontal storage, we have um, purses and we have shoes and parasols and um, anything you would want to make a 19th century outfit. So I'll finish our behind the scenes um, vault portion of this talk by pulling out a box. So this is an example of our horizontal storage. These are um, acid free boxes. 
and storing things in here. We like to have the clothing um, lay as flat as possible. Um, we don't want to have it folded over or um, you know wrinkled if we can help it. This so ideally is it laying out on this bed of acid-free tissue paper here. And so we're looking at a woman's bodice from around the year 1900, which I just absolutely adore because of that crazy screaming fuchsia color. When we look at our uh, ancestors in their black and white photos, sometimes we think that their world was black and white and gray, and nothing was farther from the truth. People, um, once they achieved synthetic dyes, they loved them and ran with them. And so, um, you know, this outfit makes a statement then as it would have today. And this one is great because it is so dang complicated. There were so many hooks and layers involved in putting on a garment. So you can see the hook and eyes. There's a set of hook and eyes that fasten the front together, that fasten the collar together. And then if you open it up, um, this is the lining, so you know the part of the garment that no one's going to see is this nice durable polished cotton in a kind of nondescript brown. And there's another set of hook and eyes that fasten the garment. Let's see if we can gently open them up. So imagine getting dressed in this every morning, and if you come to our exhibition, you'll also see the number of uh, layers of undergarments that a woman would have put on before she even got to this stage. And so inside, um, you've got these are um, pieces of boning, so this helps to kind of give the, the bodice some structure and support the garment. We've also got these wonderful dress shields. Um, so we are pre-commercial deodorant here. So a dress shield is something that goes under the arms and this would literally um, absorb the sweat from the body. This would be clipped out and thrown into the laundry because it is much easier to launder a removable dress shield than it is to try to uh, spot clean a, a fuchsia bodice like this. And then finally we have this little belt and this goes around the waist and this takes some of the stress off the um, hooks and eyes in the front. So this woman would be corseted and the idea for a bodice is that it has a very tight fit. This is not, you know, your loose blousey top, so I would have hated this era. Um, bodices generally until around 1900 were created to have this very fitted look and so um, the this belt here is going to take the stress off the front part of this garment so these hooks and eyes are not pulling as tightly. It's going to pull more on this little fabric belt around her waist. So we'll just look at a couple more and see what else is in here. This is a bodice from the late 1870s or early 1880s. What's distinctive about this time period is this was like the high water mark of beautiful buttons. All our garments from this area have this variety of just really stunning buttons. These are mother of pearl here. She's got her little watch pocket in front. Again, she's got the fabric belt here that's going to take the stress off the waist of the garment when it's hooked. Here we have another bodice, um, circa about 1900, so this is going to be another one of those super complicated ones that uh, has hooks upon hooks to keep it all together. This is also the era of the high collar. And another circa 1900 bodice at the very bottom. This is probably, I don't know, maybe mid-1890s to 1900 because they've got this puffy sleeve. Around 1895, the sleeves got absolutely huge and then they kind of shrunk in size every year after that. But these all would have had uh, matching skirts for whatever reason the skirts didn't survive or come to us, so we have to remember these garments by are the bodices. 
But it's important to keep in mind that clothing in the 19th century um, was generally custom for each woman wearing it. So it was not made for anybody, it was made for somebody. So each one of these bodices here um, are really the shell of an individual woman's body fitted specifically to her with all her idiosyncrasies. So the idea of, you know, buying a size medium shirt off the rack that anyone could wear, um, that was still decades in the future. Some of you might be wondering um, why I'm not wearing gloves. Uh, the industry standard as agreed upon today is that um, it's often better to approach historic clothing with clean hands. So my hands are freshly washed. Um, were I to wear gloves and try to um, unhook some of these fussy little hooks and eyes, I might end up unintentionally doing more damage to the garment um, in the long run because I lose the dexterity of having the, the fine control of my fingers. So that's why I've got bare hands here. And now having uh, taken a peek behind the scenes to see the pool of objects that we drew from, uh, we will go upstairs and I'll take you on a sneak peek through the exhibit. Hey. Hi everybody, now we're upstairs through the magic of technology. We have beamed ourselves to the second floor of the Illinois State Museum um, Gallery and um, full disclosure, I was recorded before, but now I am live here. So I would like to welcome you live to this presentation and thank you so much for spending your evening with us. I know there are many other things you could be doing, so we're very grateful for your presence and um, your support of the museum and your support of this exhibition. I know I'm excited for it and I think a lot of you might be as well. Um, it's going to open here on the second floor of the Illinois State Museum. It will be open when the museum opens and that date is, uh, is still a question mark. We have every hope that we will be reopening soon. So um, stay tuned to our social media feed and when we know we will let you know. So now I'm going to take some questions uh, that you might have had from the vault portion of the talk. Okay, so can you donate can donations be from a county or more than just dresses? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, can you donate? And the answer is, um, we, you may submit for donation. Unfortunately, we do receive a lot of offers, so we can't take everything that we are offered due to space issues. But the considerations that go into whether or not we accept things include, um, do we already have one like it? What condition is it in? What kind of history and provenance does it come with? Um, we especially love um, garments that come with a really powerful story. You know, like I know that so-and-so wore it on this day to this occasion, and, and the more history and provenance, the better. But the short answer is um, we would love to consider all submissions. So if there is something that someone would like to potentially donate, um, please send me an email. And my email address is erika at Oh, I'm sorry, E-R-I-K-A dot H-O-L-S-T, Erica dot Holst at Illinois dot G-O-V. And this is also the email you can use to um, shoot me any questions after the talk if you still want to know something. And then the next question is, how are these in such fantastic condition? Right? That is also a great question. And um, Part of it is a little bit of how things wind up in the museum sort of skews the perception of everyday clothing. What is surviving here, first of all, tends to be clothing that belong to um, middle class or fairly affluent individuals who had nice clothes that were more than likely special occasion dresses that were considered saving. So this might have been something that was put away, and that's generally not what happened to clothes in the 19th century. Most everyday clothes got worn and then worn out and then recycled into something else. So for things to have survived um, meant that they were special to whoever made them or owned them or wore them special enough that they would be put away. Um, but yes, some of these, um, the garments are in such amazing condition that they look like someone hung them in their closet yesterday. So we, we just got really lucky on some occasions. Do you research dresses that are sent to you? Um, 
Yes, we can help. Um, it helps to know basic biographical information like who did this belong to, if you know their birth and date, death dates and what county they lived in. Um, if it's just a piece of clothing, my, my personal skill set is not one of a sewer. I'm more of an academic appreciator of clothing, so I can't like deconstruct a garment by based on its um, construction techniques. That's that's not my skill set. But if there's a little bit of biographical information to go along with it, I can I can point you in the right direction or maybe fill in some blanks. Any non presidential famous people celebrities um, any non-presidential famous people celebrity clothes? Um, actually, all of it. We don't actually have, very, we've got a few governor's wives dresses, um, but aside from that, there's, um, it's mostly everyday women's clothing. The closest thing that we have to a celebrity in our lineup is a purple and green dress from the 1850s. Um, I'll show it to you as we go down the line here. And this belonged to Mary Lincoln's Sister, so if you count that as a celebrity, that's her claim to fame. Uh, there are a lot of questions about gloves, which I know you answered during the video, but I think because there's so many, you might want to touch on them. Yes, the back to the questions of gloves. I know it always makes people uneasy to see people handling artifacts without gloves. Um, it actually makes me uneasy sometimes too, but as I mentioned earlier, um, in this case, the Dexterity trumps the, um, the the gloveness of it. So a pair of freshly washed hands that are all clean are considered safer to work with garments, especially when you're working with hooks and eyes or pins and things like that, um, because you retain that tactile sensation. Okay, there's some about colors, specifically fuchsia and magenta. Um, how were they made? That kind of thing. I don't know specifically about the fuchsia. I do know that synthetic dyes got going around the mid 19th century. And the first one that was synthesized was purple. And we'll actually see that in Mary Lincoln's sister's dress as well. And this was a huge breakthrough that this um, artificial and very vibrant purple color was achieved and um, created the fad. And then the, the synthesization of colors, of artificial colors, only continued through the second half of the 19th century. And you can imagine as these new colors became available, people wanted to have them and to wear them. Um, do we collect ethnic clothing of immigrants that came to Illinois or, and also other people? Yes, and that would be a huge priority. That is something that Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The question is, do we um, collect immigrants' clothing and um, clothing from different ethnic groups? And the answer is yes, wholeheartedly. That is an area of the collection where we are not super strong. So we are actually actively looking to build up um, donations and, and build up our collection of clothing that came from immigrants, especially if it's perhaps their national costume that they came with or, um, or clothing that sort of speaks to different ethnic identities. Big yes. Okay, I think we are going to move on to the show and tell portion of the evening. And we will have another round of questions after. So if you have questions, you'll get another chance. Um, so we are here in what we call the timeline portion of the Fashioning Illinois exhibition. We have several different sections to this. We've got the timeline that's talking about clothing representing different decades. We've got the undergarments section, which deals with the types of undergarments that 19th century women wore. We've got sections on making, mending, washing, and recycling clothing to dig a little bit deeper into what was the actual life experience of making and wearing and caring for those clothes in the 19th century. And then we have more examples of garments um, to explore the ten different occasions that women would wear clothing. So the, uh, the exhibit covers 1820 to 1900 um, is the subtitle of the show. That was chosen for a couple of reasons. First, um, we were limited by what's in the collection. Our very earliest garment is the one on the end here. This one dates to about 1820, so um, our collection just didn't 
give us the raw material to go any earlier than that. And this 1820 year kind of coincided nicely with the um, year of Illinois statehood, which is 1818. So by starting at 1820 and continuing through 1900, we could deal with the first 80 years of um, Illinois as a state in women's attire. And I have high hopes that someday we'll be able to do a part two and we'll go into the 20th century. Um, so to be continued. But for now, I'm going to take you down the line of these garments that represent uh, different decades of women's fashion. And each of them um, kind of speak to a bigger picture. They speak to the way that society viewed women. They speak to the way women viewed themselves. Uh, they speak to the economic conditions that made the um, fabrics for the dresses available in the first place. So the very first garment here um, dates to probably about 1815 to 1820. This is the oldest dress that we have in the collection. Um, I'm guessing it belonged to a child, otherwise a very tiny woman. And this is just a simple empire-waisted white cotton gown. And uh, this is a classical revival style. So to put this in the context of the United States, uh, the United States was a new republic and had um, within living memory um, declared its independence and won its independence from Great Britain. So you have this young republic and America is looking back to the democracy of ancient Greece and the Republic of ancient Rome for its inspiration going forward with this new country founded on these Republican values. And so this uh, outfit here is literally meant to evoke like a Grecian or a Roman toga. And it's very simple. It evokes this sort of simplicity ideal that seems to suggest that the promise of America is open to everyone and that this is a very equal and egalitarian society. Um, the reality is, is not living up to the clothing. Um, Obviously, we know that when this dress was created, um, Americans were still uh, enslaving African Americans. We know that women did not have the right to vote. Um, men who did not own property did not have the right to vote when this um, dress was created. So this dress really represents more of an ideal than a fulfillment of the, pro um, the promise of America. And as we go down the line through the decades, we'll see how the American ideal and the female ideal evolve and progress was made, but probably never realized and one might argue not yet realized today, but on we go. So this is a um, roller printed cotton dress that dates from the 1830s. And first of all, this represents a technological advancement. Um, there's literally machines built that would allow you to print dyes onto fabric to give you these, uh, these cotton prints. And so um, this, again, whenever there's a new technology, a new, uh, a new fashion craze was born. So people wanted this cotton. It was also, um, fairly inexpensive. Um, there are cotton mills that are springing up in New England, in addition to cotton mills in England across the ocean that are spinning cotton and in such great quantities that it becomes available cheaply. And this is why you have this um, very romantic style starting to evolve. Um, we've got these huge poofy sleeves, we've got a very poofy skirt. There's a lot of fabric that goes into this outfit and that fabric is not possible unless cotton is cheaply available. Again, this is tied to a bigger economic picture with a stark dark side in that um, the cotton that's being produced is being grown largely on southern plantations um, using enslaved labor. So um, there's definitely a, a human cost and in general fashion like this is only made possible through the exploitation of other labor. So um, there's sort of this undercurrent of the textile industry and the garment industry that starts in the 18th century and um, continues on today with some questions about, about the human rights that underpin it. Moving on to the 1840s here. So we've got this romantic ideal sort of flourishing and what's going on in popular culture is what's been called the um, ideology of separate spheres or the cult of true womanhood. And this is where we get these very Victorian ideals that women's places in the home, women are the moral influence of their home, women are um, wives and mothers first. And so 
this ideal of womanhood, um, this dress is not like comfortable to wear. Like the armholes are set very high and tight. She's wearing this long, narrow corset that gives this sort of unnatural long V-shaped waist. She's wearing um, multiple, multiple petticoats to give her this ideal. So this is all a very idealized feminine silhouette that's not actually giving this woman a lot of freedom. And this corresponds to this ideal of women as these morally elevated um, people in society who are also at the same time very constricted by that role and, and denied the ability to do certain things or be certain things because they're um, meant to cleave so closely to this ideal. Moving on to the 1850s. So there's sort of a pattern in uh, 19th century fashion and it goes that every other decade is kind of crazy. And so it happens to be the odd number of decades where fashion gets a little wild. In this case, the 1850s. So this is Mary Lincoln's sister's dress that I mentioned. Um, it's got these very vibrant colors. It's an olive green mixed with this lovely lavender color. And this color is the first synthetic dye that was ever synthesized. And it was actually synthesized by accident. There was a chemist who was trying to make quinine to treat malaria. And um, he didn't get quinine, but he got this color that he called Movine, this purple synthetic dye. And it became an immediate fashion craze. So having a purple dress in the late 1850s meant that you were like on top of fashion. This woman is also wearing another technological fashion advancement in that she is the first one to be wearing a hoop skirt underneath. And a hoop is, um, it's the cage crinoline. It's the kind of thing you tie around your waist that's got these bands that expand the skirt. Um, they look like they would be super uncomfortable, but women at the time really embraced them because the alternative what um, they were doing decades before was many, many, many petticoats. So if you could wear two petticoats and a hoop versus 15 petticoats, the woman is going to choose the hoop and the two petticoats. Um, the hoop was, um, it was for, you know, dressing up to go out to visit people or to have company. It's not what a woman would be wearing around the house um, when she cleaned her house. She would probably just be wearing some petticoats. Um, it was cumbersome. Um, it wasn't, you know, necessarily the standard fashion. But you do see political cartoons where women's domestic servants are wearing hoops when they're um, trying to clean the house and the mistress of the house is um, upset because there are class issues and she doesn't think her maid should dress as she does and so there's there's fraught issues behind the hoop too. A couple questions on this one. So someone asked is this Elizabeth Edwards dress? It is not. This one is Frances Todd Wallace's dress. So she also lived in Springfield. She was the quiet one. Um, and can you sit in a hoop skirt? You can actually. Um, they actually like fold up almost like an accordion. So um, they, they collapse up. They do take up a lot of room. So if you've seen chairs from the 19th century, there are armless chairs that are sometimes referred to as ladies' chairs. And uh, the you know there's a old idea that um, perhaps this is because their skirts don't get caught up on like the armrests of the chair. Okay, we are moving on to the 1860s. And the 1860s is, of course, the um, decade of the Civil War. And this is when fashion um, is a little bit more subdued. Um, the North is really not feeling the effect of the Civil War. The Northern economy is actually chugging along quite nicely because there's increased um, production on farms and in factories to support the war effort. So um, the North is doing okay, and so you see really no effect on women's fashion. So we've got this ginormous skirt with yards and yards and yards of fabric, and um, this Northern lady is kind of going about her business. Were we in the South, we maybe would be seeing something a lot different because the Southern ports were closed off by blockades and um, fabric became very scarce and women were known to make and remake their garments. And you know, the most famous example is Scarlett at O'Hara and her drapes. Um, they also, there was a revival of um, home spinning in the South in the 1860s. So this is definitely a Northern ladies dress, but this is the last hurrah for the hoop that the hoop gets at its widest in the 1860s. And then in our next decade, the 1870s, we'll move along. 
Nanobook has disappeared and it will never return again. And what it's been replaced with is the bustle. And so this is a completely different silhouette. And I will actually see if I can turn here with my clean hands. So you can see that the volume of the dress, it's like the, the volume of the hoop has all been like gathered up and um, moved to the back. So this woman is wearing a different kind of skirt support underneath. She's got something tied under her waist that is literally like pushing out her back end. And so part of the challenge of mounting this show, um, first of all, was finding mannequins that these garments would fit on because this is a tiny waist here. And this is actually a child's um, mannequin. It's meant for a 10 to 12 year old child who's wearing this adult woman's dress with this very, very tiny waist here. And so um, it was important for us to create the right silhouette because without a cage support underneath, this would just kind of like flop down and it wouldn't show the way that it was actually shown in the 1870s. So what you have here, um, some scholars have argued, is an ensemble that is uh, reflective of growing urbanization in America. Now you've got these cities coming up after the Civil War and more people walking on them and a big giant hoop skirt is much less practical for city streets than this more streamlined ensemble here. And as I mentioned in the bulk portion earlier, there's a lot going on in this dress, and this is definitely a reflection of the sewing machine making its way into the average middle class woman's home. Um, Isaac Singer patented his sewing machine in the 1850s, but early on the sewing machine was very expensive, it was very big and heavy and clunky, so mainly it was garment factories and tailor shops that had sewing machines. By the 1860s and 70s, uh, the price of sewing machines had come down. They were being made with interchangeable parts. Uh, marketing had really stepped up. And so they became kind of a fixture in middle class women's home. And the promise was, oh, this will free women from all their labor because now they can sew so much faster. They can definitely sew much faster. But if you look at the amount of trim on this dress compared to the 1860s dress, we've got Bows, 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 ribbons, ribbons, ruffles, lace, pleating, ruching, whatever, you know, like any time that was saved in sewing has now been eaten out by all this elaborate trim here. So we move down the line. Uh, the 1880s and the 1870s are often very um, close because the 1880s is also a bustle decade. The bustle disappeared at the beginning part of the decade and then it came back and then it went away a little bit and then it came back and then it was gone forever by the 1890s. But um, what you see in the 1880s a lot is um, that there's business on top and party on the bottom, by which I mean that the bodice tended to be pretty like restrained. It was just kind of this plain tight fitting thing. And then all the like visual interest tended to happen on the skirt. And you often see like mixing fabrics and tassels and all the interest going on down here. So the 1880s is a time when not only has the sewing machine entered the home, but now we have the rise of commercially made patterns. And so um, prior to this, women could either sew their own garments or they could hire uh, dressmakers to make more elaborate and complex and fitted things. Um, the patterns gave enterprising women the option to uh, try to make these complex garments themselves because they have these patterns that are adjustable. And so really patterns were this democratizing influence that anyone who could sew, and that was pretty much everyone in the 19th century, um, could tackle fashion and, and have fashion at their fingertips. Move on to the 1890s. Um, this is a very, um, this is kind of a fancier example, but what's going on in the 1890s is that clothing styles are becoming um, much more simple for women. And you can kind of see it here because the bustle is gone and it will never come back again. She's wearing just this very simple A-line skirt. Um, this is the decade where you see a skirt and blouse combo really come to the forefront. So clothes are easier to wear, they're easier to care for. You can do the mix and match blouse and skirt thing. And this reflects this sort of um, 
evolving role that women have in society rather than the, the morally elevated but chained to the home woman of the pre-Civil War era. Now you've got this ideal of womanhood where a woman is robust and athletic and she's doing archery and riding bicycles and riding horses and, and it's kind of the new woman is being born. And so the new woman wears um, much less cumbersome clothing. She's still in a corset though. So there's the idea that, you know, people tight lace their corsets until they fainted and couldn't draw a deep breath and some people definitely did that but they tended to be you know the 19th century version of the Kim Kardashians the extreme fashionistas your average woman wore a corset like modern women wear a bra you know it's a supportive garment that um, kind of supports the back and breasts and they can go about their business and they can ride bicycles and corsets And our last garment here is the 1900s. And this is one of those garments from our collection that is like an absolutely flawless condition. It's hard to believe that it's 120 years old. What we have going on here, so this is sort of the last gasp of Victorianism here. Um, Queen Victoria actually dies in 1901 and her son succeeds her to the throne. And the aesthetic for women kind of changes. Um, this is a really uncomfortable last gasp. The silhouette of this is called the, um, sometimes called the mono bosom or the pigeon breast or the S curve. I'm gonna turn her a little bit here. So what you see going on is actually there's this pooch here and her bottom should be sticking out a little. I probably should have given her a little bit of a bum roll back there because her bottom should be sticking out ever so slightly. So she's got kind of like this S silhouette going on and she is still in a corset, and that corset is like long and it's engineered, so your waist bends forward and your bottom kind of sticks out and um, really super comfortable. Um, but again, this is sort of the last gasp. Things sort of um, open up, especially in the 19 teens, and then by the 1920s, things, you know, your skirts have gone to just about at your knees, and it's a completely different ballgame. So the women of 1900, if we compare her to the woman we started with in 1820, um, she's come comparatively a long way. Uh, there are much more educational opportunities for women. The number of women going to high school and college explodes in the second half of the um, 19th century. There are many more women entering the workforce. Um, they join the workforce as uh, teachers or secretaries or clerks. Um, and are earning their own women or factory, factory girls. Um, what we don't have is um, equality or equity. These are advances that mainly came to uh, white women. Women of color and immigrant women um, did not enjoy all the privileges or opportunities as white women. We also have women um, not able to vote. And standing here in 1900, women are not going to get the vote for another 20 years. Um, so we, we see kind of an evolution, um, but again, as with the beginning dress, um, we see a promise not quite yet fulfilled. So um, stay tuned for part two, the 20th century version. And now uh, I will open it up to more questions. <laughs> so one of them is about the dress forms. Do we make our own? We do not. So uh, the question is about the dress form. Do we make our own? Um, we were lucky enough to be able to borrow some from a kind institution that had recently done a fashion show and was willing to lend. So that is, um, this one is an example of that. Um, some of them um, we bought on Etsy and we uh, covered them with stockinettes so they would um, the garment would be protected and um, we stuffed that stockinette with um, a cotton batting and kind of recreated the silhouette and this was one of the challenges of the show um, as I mentioned before each of these garments is custom made and sewn for a woman you know so no one else had a body exactly like hers and our um, goal was to kind of based on the shape of her bodice and the shape of her garment, sort of recreate what this woman's body looked like with stockinette and cotton batting so the dress would fit properly on the mannequin. Okay. How would they clean your dresses without ruining the fabric, especially the special fabrics? 
excellent question. The question is about cleaning the garment. And I hope you come to see the show because we actually have a section on washing clothes. But the short answer is um, they don't really clean this undergarment. And if we can, Elizabeth, can we come in here? So this is called a chemise, and this is your basic foundational garment. This is what all women would have worn, and this is the layer that's closest to your skin. And so this, and women would have had, you know, like 10 of these in their wardrobe because they kind of cycled through them. This is the thing that's going to get super grimy. You're going to sweat in it. It's going to absorb your dirt and body oils. And you can notice it's white. It's unbleached fabric. So this is going to get stuck in the pot of boiling water, and you're going to scrub the heck out of this thing. Your outer garment, you're not going to really clean, per se. You're going to spot clean. So um, if you get a grease stain on it, um, women often had these um, like domestic receipt manuals that are like, advice books basically for managing your house and there's all these recipes you know if you get a blood stain if you get an ink stain if you get a grease stain you know do this so it's a matter of spot cleaning or let's say you're out walking on a dusty street um there were clothes brushes so you literally brush the dust off your clothes but um any of those garments that we just looked at uh they are not going to get thrown in a pot of boiling water and scrubbed vigorously we'll go so back. this exhibit seems to be so the question is um, that these garments seem to represent uh, more affluent women and does the collection have clothing that represents less affluent women? And um, this is a fantastic question, and it was kind of what I alluded to a little bit at the beginning of the talk, is the things that survive skew heavily towards um, coming from more affluent families. And the number one thing we get is wedding dresses, right? Because that's the nicest dress that someone has. It's tied to um, people's memories and a meaningful experience in their life. That's what's going to get saved. The thing that we have the least of is your common everyday work dress that you know working class women might have worn um, in a farm or a factory or um, in domestic service and the reason for that is um, uh, for a couple of reasons one these garments really didn't survive um, they were worn out um, and we have a cycle a section on recycling clothing in the show when a garment had lived past its usefulness it was often torn apart and remade into something else um, or maybe a, a child's clothes you know the good parts were cut out and it was remade into a, a kid's dress and when that was worn out the garment was cut up into rags it was cut up to make a rag doll it was put into a quilt or a rug um, so these garments didn't survive and the second reason is because people didn't think they were special enough to survive and if you you know take a mental glance backwards at all the clothes you've owned in your life versus what you still have now at this moment um, we just get rid of things because they're not special they're just stuff you know that goes away so um, people especially felt that way about their work clothes you know why would I hang on to this thing I'll save my wedding dress but not my you know work dress so that is another gap in the collection that we would love to fill and we are lucky enough um, in the other section of the exhibit we do have two work dresses and we also have a homespun dress so that homespun dress is a dress that a woman living on a farm in southern Illinois actually um, wove the cloth, spun the cloth, dyed the cloth, made the dress all by hand. So that's the kind of treasure that, you know, is actually much more exciting to a historian than the most like beautiful and elaborate and well-preserved wedding dress. We'd much rather see, you know, the work dress, the homespun dress, the one that really um, sheds light into the everyday experience of women. So we have some questions about how many dresses are in the collection and how are they stored? Do you ever have to them? Is it humidity control? Yes, so um, I don't actually have a number of how many dresses are in the collection. I would say um, it's definitely dozens and it might be as many as a couple hundred. At one point we absorbed the collections of both the Illinois State University's textile collections and the University of Illinois' textile collections. 
So there are a lot of garments there, and most of them are stored at our offsite uh, collections facility. We call it the RCC, the Research and Collections Facility. And they are, uh, most of them are stored in these long horizontal boxes, which I call coffin boxes because they're the size of, you know, a human woman's dress and you open the lid and, you know, there's a dress laying there. And so they're stored flat um, and we've got um, acid-free tissue paper between all the layers. So there's normally, you know, two or three dresses to a box. And was there a part of the question I missed? Okay. Um, what is, is there a section on men's clothing too? There is not. And this, the reason for this is twofold too. Um, one, we just don't have that many men's clothes. Um, our women's clothing collection is far stronger than our men's clothing collection. Um, I ran out of room in this show. There was just so much that I wanted to show with women that when it came to the end of it, I just didn't have room for the men. And then this is my personal bias. I feel like women's clothing are a little bit more visually interesting in that they display greater changes and you know, they're more colorful. That's my bias though, so I own that. And whoever um, you know, is sad that there's not men's clothing, um, it, it's my fault, I take responsibility. So a question about why the bustle was invented, and do we have corsets for all of our dresses? Um, why the bustle was invented? Boy, I don't know. That is a good question. Um, I, I don't know, and I don't know, you know, what the leap was or who invented the, you know, who thought like, hey, let's have women wear skirts shaped like a bell. I don't know the thinking. Maybe someone has done research out there, so I will look into it and see if there's an answer. And in terms of corsets, um, no, our corset collection is not super strong. So um, none of these ladies are wearing corsets, which would have not been appropriate at the time period. Um, but yes, <laughs> if I had my druthers, we would have had a corset representing every decade and ideally would have been able to show them, but we just don't have that in our collection. Did you make a conscious decision not to use padding in the sleeves of the 1830s dress compared to the 1890s dress? Um, so let's see, let's walk down here. The 1830s dress, uh, the question was, did I make a conscious decision not to use pa uh, padding in the 1830s dress versus the 1890s dress? The 1890s dress actually isn't padded. It's just that poofy on its own. And these sleeves have confounded me. And there's, there's a challenge to old clothes in that when they're laying in a box, you know, they look one way. And then when you try to get them on a humanoid form, they want to do something else. And um, if you purchase our catalog, of which we have a catalog coming out, I'm calling it a lookbook, it's beautiful, but I did puff the sleeves in that and it didn't look quite right. It kind of looked like a football player. And when I put arms in, so I measured out the kind of, you know, lady length arms. And when I put the dress in the arms, I saw that the, the top kind of like puffed out above the sleeves. And so um, it, I feel like that's the way it was supposed to go, but probably their needs, because in the, in the 1830s, women were known to wear like down padding around their upper arms. So probably, yes, it could have used a little more like poofiness, but um, I've been trying to, you know, let the dress tell me how it should have been worn. And this was the closest I got, but whoever pointed out that they should be puffier is probably correct. So DUD acquisition dresses, you already have in your collection, you can find better ones, and if so, can we purchase them? Um, so deaccessioning is kind of a sticky wicket, and we have a new collections policy that we um, are working on. And so um, suffice to say, there's not a whole lot of deaccessioning that's going on right now, and we'll probably need um, a policy reevaluation. Um, so, and then if they were to be deaccessioned, our um, our first choice is always to rehome garments. So we try to reach out to another institution that has a collection or that it might fit um, so it can kind of stay in the public trust. So um, some other questions deal with we would love to see the whole tour of the exhibit if possible and certain types of clothing they were looking mainly at day clothing, robes, maternities, wedding dresses have been some of the questions.
questions? Okay. Um, why don't, let's finish up with questions and then I will close out the evening by, um, we will walk you around and you can take a peek and I'll show you some of the other garments in the other room. If you so promise right to come and see the show. We're right, right at an hour too, so if you want to bail at this point, um, feel free. You won't hurt my feelings. If you want to stick around, then please do. Um, so that's one so, more question? Yeah, there's no So some of the other um, things, have you thought about making a full database like the Met Museum of Art? Perhaps a book of favorite specimens? Um, we, uh, so we do have our lookbook coming out, and this is kind of a selection of the greatest hits of this show. Um, as an institution, we would love to get more of our collections online, and this is um, a direction that we're heading. Um, it, it takes a lot of photography work and a lot of time and effort, um, so we are pointed that way. We're just not there yet, but yes, in my heart of hearts, I would love for you to be able to um, click through and see, you know, our garment highlights and our quilt highlights and just generally what we have to offer. Um, sad that we're not there yet, but stay with us and we will get there. Would you talk a little about the padding that was built into clothing to shape the silhouettes? Yeah, so a lot of this um, happens in the undergarment level. So um, women would wear um, a cage, they would wear those like sleeve puffs I told you about. And then sometimes you see padding actually like sewn right into the bodice. Um, sometimes it would maybe give a woman a little help with her bust or um, there are all kinds of little tricks that, that went on under the scenes to create these silhouettes which like, are not natural, you know, this bears no relationship to a woman's like true body, but she's trying to create, you know, the silhouette and this look. I did have a question on um, have we had to do with any green arsenic dresses? There are dresses that I am like 90% sure, yes, were dyed with green arsenic and they sit in a box and those we do wear gloves when we touch, um, but um, a, a lot of our clothing is in storage. So it's, uh, it's sitting fairly harmlessly in a box. But yes, there was, there was a wonderful exhibit, I think it was at the Met called Deadly Fashion and it talked about um, how women's dresses would literally poison them because the vibrant green dye was derived literally from arsenic and not just their dresses but you know their curtains and their wallpaper so women were um, in this poisonous environment for the sake of fashion. Okay, you want to walk around? I think we're good. Okay, so um, we will take a little bit of a walk around. Remember this exhibit is probably 95% done at this point, but not 100, so you will see some of our tools and uh, things. This is very much a behind the scenes sneak peek, so um, don't expect finished perfection. But, um, and this is just a peek because we do want you to come and check it out in real life when it opens. So this is the section on um, undergarments. And we take you through, starting with the chemise, going around the room. These are all the layers that a typical middle-class woman would have worn around the year 1860 in the order that she would have put them on. If you want to come with me over here, we've got sections on um, making and mending clothing. Yeah, you have a question. Yes. Is that 13 to 14 layers that people could have on? Just looking at the undergarments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Yeah, sure. A good like 12. 
13, 14, when you count all the accessories at the end? Here's our section on making clothing. Uh, my favorite quote comes from the young lady's friend, a domestic advice manual that says, a woman who does not know how to sew is as deficient in her education as a man who cannot write. So all women knew how to sew and sewing, at least part of their wardrobes was a um, expected and never ending domestic chore for women. And then we get to talking about dressmakers versus seamstresses. And there was definitely a professional and social hierarchy there. Dressmakers were independent business women um, who own their own businesses and were considered highly skilled workers. Most women who earn their living with a needle were seamstresses and they were considered unskilled because um, they were doing the sewing that all women were taught as small girls and they were um, paid accordingly by the nascent garment industry. They were not paid well and not treated well. And uh, some of these, um, you know, fast fashion garments, garment industry issues persist today and were present at the very beginning of the garment industry. Moving over here, we've got mending and remaking clothing. This is one of my favorites. I love period mending. So we have some mittens and some socks. And this shows that just like making clothing was something that a woman could expect to do for her entire life, mending clothing was a never ending chore. So women could always expect to mend their clothes. And women knew how, you know, having made a lot of their own clothes, they knew exactly how much money and how much work and how much time went to each garment. And so they'd much rather mend and patch and fix rather than try to create something new. So this is um, definitely a sensibility that has been lost to modern times. Um, I don't know how to darn a sock. My son's sock had a hole in it and I threw it out and bought him another pair from Target and I'm not proud of this, you know. I don't have skills. I'm not treating the environment well, um, but you know, here we are. The, the mending skills have really been lost through the generation. And then remaking clothing. This is one of my favorite sections. Um, there are very few who do not renovate and make over their old dresses when they've grown too old fashioned to be presentable. So I'm going to take the cover off this. This is something we are super fortunate to have. This dress started life in the 1860s. So this was the bodice. It would have had like drop shoulders, kind of simple sleeves, and it would have had a hoop skirt. At some point in the 1890s, someone started the process of remaking it. So they took fabric from the skirt and remade the sleeves to make them the poofy 1890s kind and um, narrowed the silhouette of the skirt. And for whatever reason, they didn't finish the way it came to us was with the sleeves detached. So we kind of put it back together to show this remaking project frozen in time in the 1890s. We're about 10 minutes over, so we probably ought to wrap up. So we're 10 minutes over. I'm going to finish up in the uh, section of different uh, types of garments. And we're skipping two sections, but you'll just have to come and see them. We may also do a virtual walkthrough at some point. I know a lot of people have asked. So these are two of our treasures because these are two work dresses. Um, they are both printed cottons. They're small figured and small figures means that it's easier to um, match the pattern together than like a huge print. Um, these dresses both underwent a lot of wear. They've been beat up over time. Um, they took probably a lot of abuse and were scrubbed, but these were dresses that women actually worked in. And you see we've got the 1860s women and we did not style her in a hoop. This was a woman who um, was working in, she was in Morgan County on a farm. So um, she probably wouldn't have had a hoop on when she was going about her farm work. This is a dress that belonged to a woman who worked in Sangamon County in the city of Springfield um, around the year 1900. So um, both of these women are proper, you know, they've got their 
collars and cuffs on, which were a standard part of women's outfits, um, but they're not showy or flashy. 